Number five, Yang Yongjin. Yang Yongjin is a controversial Chinese clinical psychiatrist, infamous for his practice of trying to treat internet addiction. Well, that almost sounds noble. Now, I definitely spend too much time on Twitter for my own good. What's so evil about getting people to spend more time in the real world? Well, it could be because of his methods, you know? Yang is a firm believer in electroconvulsive therapy, and if you're not familiar with that term, it's a fancy process in which surges of electricity are ran through a patient, inducing a small seizure to treat mental illness. So the way to treat people who are spending too much time on electronic devices is to hook them up to something electronic and let electricity run through their body painfully. Yeah, okay, no, I'm starting to understand where some of this controversy is coming from. Yang believes that people suffering from internet and gaming addiction suffer from personality disorders and need to be treated as such. His clinic doesn't really run like a regular clinic, but has been more closely described as a boot camp. Parents sign away their children into Yang's foster care, who then gets sent to a prison-like environment of harsh treatments and cruel conditions. Yang would treat his patients in a military-like manner, punishing them with more treatments for misbehavior, or rewarding patients who would act as informants against other patients. In addition to round-the-clock shockings, Yang would also administer medications to his patients without the consent of them or their parents by sneaking them in as diet supplements. Yang would punish patients who tried to get their parents to take them home with, well, you can probably take a guess, more shocks. Yang's practice has since been shut down, but in the time it operated, it's estimated that as many as 6,000 patients were exposed to cruel treatments by the doctor. Yang's controversial methods caught him international attention, even in pop culture. The popular multiplayer video game Dead by Daylight, in which players play a monster attacking a team of players trying to survive, featured a character actually inspired by Yang. In 2017, the development studio held a poll for Chinese players to, on suggestions for a Chinese monster, since the game was very big there. And Yang was a popular write-in vote, as obviously Chinese gamers would see him as a monster, leading the team to create a character who was a doctor who used electricity to shock his opponents. Releasing with him as well was a survivor named Feng Min, an esports pro serving as the doctor's nemesis, an internet addicted patient, and a map set in a Chinese asylum to boot. Before the final release of the character though, the doctor was changed to an American backstory, presumably to avoid any possible pushback or controversy of comparison to the real doctor. But it's probably saying something if your audience considers you a monster on the level of Michael Myers and Freddy. Next up at number four, Dr. Sigmund Rascher. Known for his cruel contributions to the German army in World War II, Sigmund Rascher is among one of the worst scientists in human history. Sigmund's father was also a physician and an avid follower of Rudolf Steiner, an occultist and self-proclaimed clairvoyant. So naturally, Sigmund attended the first Waldorf school based on Rudolf Steiner's philosophies. He went on to study medicine in Munich and later worked for an internship in Switzerland with his father. But Despite his upbringing, it seems he grew to align with some other ideologies, eventually joining the German paramilitary organization. And that is where his evil doings would begin. He denounced his father and soon became acquainted with the leader, asking for human subjects to be placed at his disposal. He made it clear the experiments could prove fatal, but that it would be required for accurate results. By 1942, he began conducting experiments in pressure chambers, where he would simulate a high altitude and then quickly alter the pressure to simulate the conditions of a pilot free falling with no oxygen. Allegedly, the leader mentioned that those who survived could be pardoned death at the camp, but Sigmund talked him out of it, stating that they didn't deserve any amnesty. Further, he conducted cruel freezing experiments on 300 prisoners, allegedly to figure out the best way to warm up soldiers who experienced hypothermia. He would either force his victims to remain out outdoors completely naked in freezing temperatures for up to 14 hours or would place them in tanks of ice water for three hours, measuring their pulse and internal temperatures all the while. From there, they would try to warm up the victims, usually with water, but experimented using a variety of different temperatures, including boiling, and this would often cause further harm. Along with his other forms of torture under the guise of science, Sigmund would administer polygal, a substance to aid blood clotting and then shoot or amputate a limb on his victim to see the speed at which they would bleed out. But I will let you know he eventually did get what was coming to him after years of falsified 
facts from botched experiments, as well as killing his own lab assistant, Sigmund was executed under the order of the leader, and in 1990, his experiments were ruled inhumane and criminal on top of containing falsified data. Number three, Albert Krigman. Right off the top, I just feel like this guy's got an evil scientist name. Krigman just, I don't know, hits the ear wrong. Well, he was guilty of a lot more than a scary sounding name. Dr. Krigman was a dermatologist who was contracted by Dow Corning, Johnson & Johnson, and the US Army to research the effects of chemical compounds on human skin. Being offered a modest 10 grand in grant money, Krigman set out to work right away, finding a bevy of inmates of Philadelphia's Holmesburg prison, where he would experiment on thousands of inmates with little to no regard for the prisoner's safety or long-term health. It was documented that the experiments at Holmesburg Prison entailed a delightful assortment of things like hair transplants, implantation of foreign bodies, burns and radiation of the skin, exposure to dioxin, application and ingestion of toxic materials and near lethal doses of acne medicine, and the yanking of fingernails to round it off. Delightful. One of the chemicals Krigman exposed his test subject to that I mentioned earlier, dioxin, was the main contaminant in Agent Orange the controversial chemical agent used in the Vietnam War by the Americans. Krigman was being paid to research the effects of dioxin on skin, and suffice it to say, it is not pleasant remotely. I hope there's a picture of something disgusting behind me. Inmates would be scarred, left sick, with permanently disfigured skin conditions leading to painful long-term side effects. Oftentimes as well, many subjects were exposed to all sorts of contaminants and other infections from the unsafe conditions of his experiments. Most of his inmates were brown by financial compensation, ranging anywhere from $30 to $50 for smaller experiments or $800 for some of the more extreme cases. This small bit of cash was really appealing enough to attract a constant supply of victims, prisoners, who had very little in the way of funds. This allowed them to get a little bit of freedom, a little bit of power within the prison, but also let them have a bit of hope that maybe they'd one day pay off their bail. Krigman destroyed many of the notes from his research, but through testaments from his victims, we know the truth of what he got up to. While there have been many attempts to get justice after the fact for what the inmates experienced, Krigman himself lived to the ripe old age of 93 and never faced any sort of consequences for his actions whatsoever. In fact, he was thrilled by the opportunity. Listen to this quote from Krigman describing how he felt setting up shop at the prison. All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing a fertile field for the first time. That, that sounds made up. That sounds like horror movie bad guy dialogue. That sounds like something Jigsaw would say. But no, it was a real guy who was allowed to experiment on a lot of real people. Next up is Shiro Shi. A notorious microbiologist and surgeon during the War of Resistance, a conflict between China and Japan in the 30s and 40s, Shiro Ishii led the development and application of biological warfare for the infamous Unit 731, and is truly an evil scientist if I've ever heard of one. Prior to his evil experiments, he was actually known as a pretty brilliant man. He had a photogenic memory and studied medicine at the Kyoto Imperial University. But despite his high credible grades, he was not known to get along well with his classmates. During his studies, he was known to grow bacteria in petri dishes and refer to them as his pets, a practice that made many uncomfortable as they felt he was treating the bacteria as more of a companion than a research subject, potentially the first red flag in what would become a sea of evil and horrendous experiments. By 1927, Ashi was advocating for the creation of a bioweapons program, something that was a against the Geneva Convention at the time, but did not yet have enough power within his unit to make it happen. But in 1936, he was promoted to senior army surgeon and given full control over Unit 731, a decision I can only assume is regretted to this day. In these facilities, with no one to tell him no, Ishii decided to unleash his evil experiments on live humans, as he believed he could not get the results he was looking for by testing on animals. Ishii was notorious for injecting his subjects with deadly diseases under the guise of vaccines so that he could watch and study the effects if left untreated, leaving his victims suffering 
horrifying symptoms and eventually letting them die. But that was only the tip of the iceberg. Victims of his evil experiments would also have limbs amputated and reattached to other parts of their bodies, while conscious and without the use of any anesthesia. Or they'd be put into pressure chambers until their eyes literally escaped their skulls. It's estimated that nearly 10,000 people died at the hands of Shiro Ishii's cruel experiments, but perhaps most insane of all is that after the war ended, he was never charged with any war crimes, as he traded the information he obtained in his experiments for immunity and then lived out the remainder of his life in Japan a free man. And last up, we have Harry Harlow. Harry Harlow was an American psychologist during the 30s to the 50s, and although he didn't experiment on people, he is widely regarded as cruel and unethical for his experiments on monkeys. Harlow had one big question. What was the meaning of love? Initially it started as an earnest study looking at the bond between a mother and her offspring, and early on it did actually provide psychologists with some valuable information about the importance of connection in those early years. But Harlow soon became obsessed and began blurring the lines of ethical experimentation until soon he was nothing more than a monster. What was once about discovering the importance of early stage bonding morphed into long term isolation and the mental effects it had on the monkeys. Harlow and his team had what they literally called the pits of despair, I kid you not, where the test subjects would be isolated without any contact, including the smells and sounds of other monkeys for up to a year. The results of his experiment were severely damaged monkeys who as he described were obliterated socially. After being released from isolation, many refused to eat and some ended up dying from starvation. Autopsies would show the monkeys were actively choosing not to eat, causing some to believe that he had actually driven the animals to such bad mental states that they no longer wanted to be alive. Over the years, he got the name monkey torturer as on top of extended isolation, he would also actually force the monkeys to mate using an archaic device. However, However, because he was conducting such experiments prior to the Animal Welfare Act of 1966, not only did he not face any repercussions, he was actually awarded for his findings and highly celebrated among many in his industry. This doesn't mean he went uncriticized for his unethical treatment. Some of the students that worked in Harlow's unit at the university have come forward saying that they had nightmares of the experiments being conducted and couldn't wait until he retired to shut down the entire operation. Others said that anybody with respect for life would find this offensive, and all he left was one huge mess to clean up. Later Harlow went on to say in a 1974 interview, I don't really like animals. I despise cats. I hate dogs. How could you like a monkey? So despite looking for the meaning of love, it seems he was more interested in torturing innocent monkeys and causing irreversible harm. Number 5. The Monster Study Wow, right into it, huh? Great name for it and all. The Monster Study was a terrifying and triggering speech and stuttering experiment that took place in 1939. Performed on 22 orphans and conducted by Wendell Johnson, the professor of speech and pathology at the University of Iowa. Half of the people received positive speech therapy, praising the fluency of their speech. I just watched King's speech with Colin Firth and let me tell you, yeah, it's uh, nothing like that, no. That had a happy ending with metaphors and lessons interwoven. This is just science being cruel. Because the other half, the negative speech therapy, which includes belittling the subjects for speech imperfections, yeah, just straight up chirping at people, suffering a lifetime of obvious emotional stress already, and of course, retaining that stress and speech difficulty for the remainder of their life. It was dubbed the monster study as some of Johnson's peers were absolutely pissed and horrified that he would experiment on orphanage subjects at such a tender age in development to confirm his hypothesis. Yeah, sick stuff, dude, really? Basically, good reinforcement meant fast learning. You ever been yelled at by a parent while doing math? Yeah, it's horrible. 
On top of everything, the experiment was kept hidden for fear Johnson's reputation would be tarnished in the wake of human experiments conducted during the war. Uh, you think? The results were actually never published, and his thesis is the only official record of the details. Apparently, the university apologized in 2001, but the university assistant professor of speech pathology said the data collected from the experiment is unfortunately the largest collection of scientific information on stuttering that we have, and that Johnson's work was the first to discuss the importance of the thoughts and beliefs and feelings of the actual individual struggling. Number four, multiple births. The 1960s were a dark time for medicine. Clinical psychiatrist Peter Nobauer and the couple of professors at Yale University thought it'd be a good idea to persuade Louise Wise Services, an adoption agency, to send twins and triplets to completely different homes without telling the adoptive parents and they were adopting a child who was of uh, another sibling. And neither did the biological parents, of course. <laughs> Whoa, what? Yeah, that's not cool. I can see angry mama bears right now just clawing at the screen. Apparently, researchers sponsored by Children's Services secretly compared their research and progress in now what is called the infamous Twins Study. The research was never completed, but what was left behind was the unethical treatment and trauma of separating individuals at birth. That didn't end, apparently, in New York until the 1980s. In 1990, a decade after the confidential study, Nobauer and the Child Development Center of the Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services arranged to actually house the locked records at Yale. University. The Jewish board set terms that gave the organization power to approve or deny any requests to access the records for the next 75 years. In 2018, apparently a couple thousand pages were released to the public, but of course, like all things intending to be silent, the pages were heavily redacted. Yeah, lots of sharpieing. Yo, this is absolutely terrifying, okay? Like, what did they find in that study? Also, so sad. There's been a couple documentaries now covering this study and focusing on the trauma it's caused to those who again beg to gain access to their own files. In 2011, apparently the Jewish board denied two separate twins the request to access their own sealed records. So what exactly happened that made these scientists so secretive of their work? Number three, Stanford Prison. The Stanford Prison Experiment was a psychological experiment conducted in the summer of 1971. Pretty standard university experiment. A two-week simulation of a prison environment that examined the effects of situational variables on participants. Yeah, what could go wrong, right? Well, we just heard how when it comes to university studies, the law all of a sudden becomes this imaginary thing. Stanford University psychology professor Philip Zimbardo led this research study. Participants were recruited from the local ad and a local school newspaper engineered by the research team, offering only male participants 15 bucks per day for those to participate in a fun study looking at prison life. <laughs> Yeehaw! People were handpicked after psych assessments, then randomly assigned roles of either prisoner or guard. Like a giant game of cops and robbers, right? The guards were given uniforms and instructed to prevent prisoners from escaping. No rules. The experiment officially started when prisoners were booked by real Palo Alto police. And over the next five days, psychological abuse by the guards became more and more sadistic. The experiment was actually forced to end on the sixth day. Let's just say it got so violent, it's known as one of the most unethical psychological experiments in history. The harm and abuse inflicted on the participants prompted universities worldwide to improve their own ethics departments, and experiments were then severely reevaluated by the educational board before they began. This was an example of use of power, the barbarism of humans, the sick experimental boundaries those are risking to put others through for career-breaking research. Scary stuff. Number two, Burke and Hare. The Burke and Hare murders were a series of 16 separate targeted murders committed over the span of about 10 months in 1828 in Edinburgh, Scotland. The culprits, you guessed it, William Burke and William Hare. These two were so rotten, they actually dug up and sold corpses to surgeons like Robert Knox for dissection. You see, Edinburgh was the leading city of anatomical study in the 1800s, and all that research demanded a ton of cadavers to experiment on. Due to the rapid shortage of cadavers to do research on, hence the time of medicine, 
Grave digging became a huge issue. Scottish law required that all corpses used for medical research shall only come from deceased prisoners or sick houses. Okay, <laughs> and cue organized crime. This led body snatching to become a huge thing. I mean, easy and plentiful to make a quick buck, right? But to make sure graves were left untouched, mort safes and gates were put up in cemeteries to act as almost like bear traps on top of the graves. Of course, this is where our gentlemen come into this. The men, instead, decided to go on a rampage taking fresh and very alive victims' bodies right then and there. Yeah, gruesome stuff. Then they would take them on down to the medical center and payday. The police offered Hare immunity from prosecution if he knew anything. Basically, if you snitch, your name's clean. He fessed up the details immediately of the victims and confessed to all 16 deaths with his accomplice. Formal charges were made against Burke and he was hanged to death. His corpse was dissected and his skeleton displayed at the Anatomical Museum of Edinburgh Medical School, where, as of 2022, still remains. Okay, the last part's a little sadistic, no? Also very ironic. Number one, Jose Delgado. Rodriguez Delgado's research was cutting edge for his time. It was centered on the use of electrical signals to invoke responses in the brain. This is like way before Neuralink and scientists were trying to microchip us for like Interac and stuff. It was the early 40s, a dark time for medicine. Famed for his research on mind control through electrical stimulation of the brain. His earliest work was actually with cats, but of course, if you haven't guessed, he later experimented with monkeys and then eventually humans. Specifically, psychiatric patients. Delgado's work was centered around a certain invention he coined the Stimoceiver, a radio which joined the stimulator of brainwaves with a receiver. This allowed the subject of an experiment full freedom of movement while allowing the experimenter to control the experimentee. Very sci-fi for the time, you know? Basically the math behind putting a giant antenna in your head, but it's inside your head. The stimoceiver was used to simulate emotions and control the person's behavior. Stimulation on different points in the amygdala in four patients produced a variety of effects including deep concentration, odd feelings, and colorful visions. Okay, no, not so bad so far. Delgado could not only elicit emotions, he could also elicit tons of movement. Yeah, we're talking weekend at Bernie's type movement, but subtle at first, like a limb or the clenching of a fist, then bigger limbs and more movement. Basically, this guy was driving you via your brain. Mad scientist or the pioneer of electric brain stimulation? Mm, maybe you can be both. Number five on this list is the aviator suit. Parachutes took a while to master guys and no one knows that better than Franz Reichelt. Mental Floss says if there's anything to be said for Franz Reichelt, it's that he had some supreme confidence in his own invention. In the early 1900s, Reichelt crafted a parachute from 320 square feet of fabric, all of which folded up into a wearable aviator suit. He had conducted several parachute tests using dummies which all failed. He pinned the blame on the building saying that they simply weren't tall enough. In 1912, Reichelt planned to test his latest version by flinging a dummy from the Eiffel Tower. But when he arrived at the famous landmark, the inventor surprised the waiting crowd by strapping on the parachute himself and taking the leap. The parachute didn't open and Reichelt became a victim of his own invention. An autopsy reportedly determined that he of a heart attack on the way down. Imagine having the confidence to jump off of the Eiffel Tower using a so-called parachute that has literally never worked before. Number four on this list is the 10 cent beers. All right, so this isn't really a science experiment at all, but it is an experiment of some kind. Mental Floss says in 1974, the Cleveland Guardians tinkered with a new promotion to increase game attendance, giving fans the opportunity to purchase an unlimited amount of beer for 10 cents a cup, which wasn't the best idea. The game against the Texas Rangers was an eventful one. Memorable events of the evening included a woman running into the Guardians on deck circle and flashing the umpire, a fan running onto the field and sliding into second base, and a father and son who ran onto the outfield and mooned the bleacher section. Things took a violent turn when fans launched fireworks into the Rangers dugout and the whole thing eventually turned into an all out riot. Fans against players on both teams. Players were hit with folding chairs, there were numerous fist fights, and some players were injured when they were pelted with rocks. After that, the Cleveland Guardians kept 10 cent beer nights, but limited 
limited the promotion to two drinks per person. So basically, humans and 10 cent beers do not go well in a public setting. I also looked it up with an inflation calculator and even today, that would have been 60 cents a beer. Yeah, I can see how that could have been a problem. Number three on this list is the ape experiment. Yeah, you know, I didn't think it would take a rocket scientist to figure out that raising your kid among apes was a bad idea, but here we are. Mental Floss says, in the early 1930s, comparative psychologist Winthrop Kellogg and his wife welcomed a healthy baby boy they named Donald. The psychologist had grown interested in those stories of children who were raised feral, but he didn't send Donald to be raised by wolves. He did the opposite. He managed to get his hands on a similar aged baby chimp named Gua and raised her alongside Donald. Gua initially did better than Donald in tests that included things like memory, scribbling, strength, dexterity, reflexes, problem solving, climbing, obviously, language comprehension, and more. But she eventually plateaued, and it became evident that no amount of equal treatment was going to make her behave more like a human. But when the Kelloggs ended the experiment, they did so abruptly and without much explanation, which is contrary to the meticulous records they otherwise took throughout the course of the study. While Gua wasn't showing any signs of picking up English, Donald had started to imitate the vocalizations of his sister from another species, so it's not hard to speculate why the Kelloggs called it quits. Guys, I'm all for having a pet, but when my kid starts acting more like the pet than me, that's where we need to call it, I think. Kelloggs felt the same way, and hopefully that will be the last time anyone ever tries something like this. Number two on this list is the soul experiment. So in all honesty, this one is pretty dumb in my opinion, but if it's actually accurate, then this would make for an incredible discovery. Mental Floss says in 1901, Duncan McDougall conducted experiments on extremely recently deceased people and dogs to see if their body weight changed immediately after a decrease in weight, he theorized, would be indicative of a physical soul leaving the body. To test this theory, he weighed six people before and after their death and concluded that there was a weight difference anywhere from half to one and a half ounces. He repeated the experiment on dogs and found no difference, and therefore, by McDougall's reasoning, dogs have no souls. Other scientists have been critical of this experiment from day one, citing issues like small sample size and imprecise methods of measurement. Sounds like my dude Duncan was more of a cat person, honestly. I don't know, folks. It feels like there are a lot of holes in this experiment and not a whole lot of logic. Maybe Maybe it is accurate though, and we do have souls that weigh something. And finally, number one on this list is the Unib. Mental Floss says, it's probably safe to say that an experiment falls into the gone wrong category when it may have been responsible for producing the Unib. As an undergrad at Harvard in the late 1950s and early 60s, Ted Kaczynski participated in a three-year-long study run by Henry A. Murray that explored the effects of stress on the human psyche. After being asked to submit an essay about their worldview and personal philosophies, Kaczynski and 21 other students were interrogated under bright lights, wired to electrodes, and completely torn down for their beliefs. The techniques were intended to break enemy agents during the Cold War and the students were never completely informed about the nature of the study. In short, the man who would eventually kill three people and injure over 20 more with his homemade was subjected to repeated psychological torture. Any experiment that ends up with this happening obviously went very wrong and never should have happened in the first place. People have a limit, and it seems like these experiments just pushed people way past them. Obviously, this is not an excuse for Ted's behavior in any means, but I'm sure that it was a big factor in making it happen. Number five, Nanulak. Kicking this list off, we have a beast more terrifying than literally any other creature on this planet right now. Apparently this thing is real. Yeah. The apex predator. The top of the food chain. Twice interbred. This thing is a killing machine. The grizzly polar bear hybrid. AKA the growler bear or the pizzly bear. Great names, great names. What do you like? I like the pizzly bear myself. It's the least aggressive. These two aggressive bears make up this rare hybrid that has occurred both in captivity and in the wild. So not only did they try this one in a lab, safe with test tubes, in nature this thing just evolved by itself and is just trucking around hunting as we speak. Yeah, 
That's horrifying. In 2006, the hybrid was confirmed by testing the DNA of a unique looking bear shot in the Northwest Territories on Banks Island in the Canadian Arctic. A hunter from Idaho reportedly shot a grizzly polar bear hybrid near Saks Harbor in April with his local guide. They had been hunting for polar bears and killed the animal believing it to be a normal find. Officials took interest in the creature after noticing that while it had thick white fur, it also had long razor sharp claws, a humped back, a shallow face, brown patches on its body, and was almost twice the size, which are all traits of grizzly bears. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeehaw! DNA tests conducted by Wildlife Genetics International in British Columbia confirmed it was a hybrid with polar bear as a mother and a grizzly bear as a father. Yeah. Netflix can't be horror, here we come. The number of confirmed hybrids has now risen to eight, all of them being children from the same female hybrid polar grizzly bear mother. There's only a couple of them. Yeah, thank God. Since the 2006 discovery, the hybrid has been referred to by several names, including Pizzly Bear and the Roller Bear, but Canadian wildlife officials have suggested calling the hybrid bear Nanolac, taken from the Inuit names for Polar Bear and Grizzly Bear. Yeah, that's a sick name. That's a way better name. Let's go with that name, 100%. Number four, the Kulakamba. The Kulakamba or Kulukamba is an apparent hybrid species of chimpanzee and gorilla hybrid found and reported in Africa in the early 19th century. Although no empirical evidence has been found to substantiate the existence of the creature more than once, the Kulakamba has been referenced in numerous times in some mid 19th century work and in some descriptive work from around 1860 to 1899 titled Explorations and Adventures in Equatorial Africa. The explorers refer to this unique ape hybrid as the Kulakamba based upon the description of words used by the First Nations people in the Ovenga River of West Africa. The people allegedly refer to the ape as Kulu because of its unique vocalization, unlike the sounds and abilities of other apes. Kamba is a word meaning quote, to speak. Okay, that's terrifying. The local people upon finding this hybrid creature were saying that its name came from its ability to make sounds and talk unlike any other species. The Kulakamba is believed to be much larger with a flattened face, longer, larger skull, but more bipedal than a chimpanzee, meaning it walked on its legs much more like us. Although there has not been a documented sighting of the Kulakamba since 1881, in 1996, a picture of an unusual looking ape was taken by Peter Jenkins and Liza Gadsby at the Cameroon Zoo, showing a seemingly hybrid ape that fit all the descriptions of the Kulakamba, being supposedly that of a chimpanzee and gorilla hybrid. Could this be like a new form of sapien roaming our planet? Is this thing Bigfoot that the FBI is talking about? I don't know, what do you think? Number three, pythons. In the 1980s, a small number of pet Burmese pythons were released into Florida wildlife. Couple here, couple there, nothing crazy. Since then, these slithering snakes have started to wreak absolute havoc on wildlife and communities and have become something of a weird science project. A number of Burmese pythons running loose in the state of Florida are now officially a hybrid species, which could make them even more evolved than their other snake relatives. Scientists from the United States Geological Survey of the Everglades National Park analyzed skin and cell tissues from around 400 Burmese pythons that were captured in Florida between 2001 and 2012. The team wanted to learn more about the invasive species in order to better understand Florida's threat of the overgrowing population posed by wildlife and locals. Sure. The researchers expected to find only the pure genetic makeup of the Burmese python, coined the American alligator killer. It's quite the reputation. But according to the study, the number of interbred snakes with somewhat of a new genetic makeup started becoming more worrisome the more that they found. When two species come together, they have a unique set of generic traits and characteristics that they use for survival. This is made up of the environment around them. Indian rock pythons are smaller but much faster. Burmese pythons thrive in jungles and grassy marshes and are much, much bigger. Together, mixed with a little swap and spit, is this demon serpent. Yeah, the new and improved Floridian Jungle Croc Annihilator. Again, Q campy Netflix movie, Croc Killer 5. I don't know, or something like that. When researchers involved in the new study analyzed samples found in Florida, they discovered that some animals assumed to be purebred pythons were also carrying new DNA making a new rock python. Yeah, that's awesome. Couple of guys let their pets out and now there's snakes with double the abilities running around or slithering around just by accident. This guy just rushed like a million years of evolution, yeah. Thanks, Florida. 
Number two, Beetlejuice. A living beetle computer hybrid with legs that can be fully controlled by humans has been created by researchers in Singapore. I feel like that should have been on every newspaper in like 2016. Like, did you hear about this? Cause like I never did, you know? The beetle joins a long list of insects that have been turned into robots since the early 2000s. The others of course including hawk moths and cockroaches. None of those insects however had their walking speed, step frequency and gait fully controlled by humans making the beetle bot the first of its kind. Okay, this thing is terrifying. I've seen what Sophia does with the AI that is capable over at Hanson Robotics. This thing's gonna be the next bug terminator. Like, I feel like this is the prequel to Starship Troopers. Researchers apparently ran electrodes into the leg muscles in the beetle's first pair of legs and then stimulated movement by running currents through each other specific leg, Dr. Octavius style. The giant flower beetle, or Messi Norina Torcata, was then controlled via wires mounted onto the insect by Dr. Hirotika Sato, an aerospace engineer, and his team from Nayang Technology University in Singapore, tracking the beetle's motion with a 3D motion capturing system. They were then able to make the beetle gallop and walk alternating legs. First off, this is a little cruel, but also pretty cool. I didn't even know that bugs had muscles in their legs. The hybrid might prove a useful step towards building robots for use in disaster zones where they could be equipped with cameras or microphones and navigated through tiny cracks to search for humans trapped under rubble. Okay, I like this thing all of a sudden again. Yeah, this is good. This is good news. Blending technology with the animal kingdom. Ant-Man and Wasp style. I like it. Due to the beetle still being alive, of course, humans would be able to switch from controlling the beetle to letting it navigate on its own way. When the insect computer hybrid robot encounters an obstacle, the user can simply switch off the controller, allowing the neural control networks of the robot to overcome the obstacle. In doing so, the researchers can manipulate the different walking speeds, patterns, flying directions, and all other forms of the motion. Basically, it's playing PlayStation with a bug. And number one, killer bees. Speaking of more creepy crawlies, we have these nasty things. The African honeybee, AKA killer bee, is a hybrid produced originally by crossbreeding the East African honeybee with various of the European bees. First introduced in Brazil in 1956, 26 swarms escaped quarantine and since then, this aggressive hybrid has spread throughout South America and North America by 1991. Yeah, that means before Pearl Jam was really going, there wasn't too many of these flying around. Once in a blue moon kind of deal. But time flies. Typically much more defensive than any other honeybee, these killer bees react faster and can chase a person a quarter of a mile. They kill about a thousand people each year and even kill cows and horses. Although there are 29 recognized subspecies of bee, this seems to be the most aggressive. Biochemists have tracked down the brain chemicals that make killer bees so ferocious. It's the compounds which seem to be present in higher levels in the much feared Africanized honeybee, which makes less aggressive bees turn more fierce. That means that it can turn other insects into a more aggressive version of themselves. Honeybees are incredibly territorial, fighting to the death to defend their hive with multiple painful stings, but killer bees, the even crazier hybrids of the relatively docile strain, are more aggressive. Yeah, way more aggressive. Apparently these things are also really, really smart. Like, fish and bees are now able to communicate to each other. Do you know that? In a recent experiment done in Austria in 2019, using a robot translator, engineers from Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and four other universities are able to make the species able to transmit signals back and forth to each other, subsequently resulting in them demonstrating coordinated decisions. Yeah, Google it. Apparently these bees are so smart, they can signal underwater to fish. Yeah, we might not even need the controller for the bugs soon enough. Just when I thought the animal kingdom couldn't get even scarier, bees and fish are texting each other. Number five on this list is the human mouse. Now, how the heck did they manage this one? Popular Mechanics says, scientists at the University at Buffalo and the Roswell Park Cancer Institute have bred a new form of human mouse chimera with the highest incidence of human cells ever recorded. Two weeks after the researchers injected human stem cells into the developing mouse embryos, one of the new newborn mice exhibited 4% human cells, a major advance considering human and animal cells don't typically jive well. While they're still mostly just mice and only a tad bit human, the breakthrough marks a step toward more advanced genetically modified embryos in the future. It's not been possible to generate any human stem cells that substantially contribute to mouse embryos, the scientists say in the paper's abstract. Their work may enable 
naval applications such as human organ generation in animals. They go on in that article to get very technical with things and break down exactly how they did it, but in all honesty it got very confusing very quickly to somebody without a science background. The big takeaway here is that there is a mouse out there that is actually 4% human. That mouse to my knowledge, would be the closest thing in the universe right now to a human being without it being an actual human being. Like, think about that. There is a mouse out there that is kind of like our long lost cousin. This, like, everything on this list starts to get very ethically and morally questionable. At what percent of human does this mouse start to become untouchable? Like at what point do our laws, rights and freedoms start to apply to the mouse? 20% human? 30% human? 50%? When does this mouse stop being a mouse and start being a human and start getting treated like a human? And also, what the heck would a 50% mouse and 50% human even look like? Like, we're getting into some seriously weird territory here, and as much as I get that this could be good for science or whatever, I'm pretty sure I can go the rest of my life without ever having to see a half mouse, half human thing. Ugh. Number four on this list is the human rabbit. You know, if I had to become a human hybrid of any animal, I feel like a rabbit would be cool. At least then I could jump really high and maybe I could finally dunk. The Washington Post says, scientists in China have, for the first time, used cloning techniques to create hybrid embryos that contain a mix of DNA from both humans and rabbits, according to a report in a scientific journal that has reignited the smoldering ethics debate over cloning research. More than 100 of the hybrids made by fusing human skin cells with rabbit eggs were allowed to develop in laboratory dishes for several days before the scientists destroyed them to retrieve so-called embryonic stem cells from their interiors. Although scientists in Massachusetts had previously mixed human cells and cow eggs in a similar attempt to make hybrid embryos as a source of stem cells, those experiments were not successful. Researchers said yesterday they were hopeful that the rabbit were would lead to a new and plentiful source of embryonic stem cells for research and eventually for medical use. But theologians and others decried the work as unethical. Unethical seems to be the theme of this video, folks. That article by the Washington Post was actually written back in 2003. That's right guys, this happened almost two decades ago, meaning that there has been tons of time for them to make better hybrids behind closed doors. Now I'm not saying that they continued with these projects, but I'm also not saying that they didn't continue either. There was a lot of backlash when this first came out, so continuing with this without people knowing, that might have been desired. Who knows, there could be a fully grown rabbit man hopping around somewhere in some Chinese lab for all we know. Number three on this list is the human pig. This is a thing, guys. I really can't believe it is, but this is a literal thing. Stat News says pig embryos that had been injected with human stem cells when they were only a few days old began to grow organs containing human cells, scientists reported on Thursday, an advance that promises or threatens to bring closer the routine production of creatures that are part human and part something else. These human pig chimeras were not allowed to develop past the fetal stage, but the experiment suggests such creations could eventually be used to grow fully human organs for transplant, easing the fatal shortage of organs. 120,000 people in the United States are waiting for life-saving transplants, but every day two dozen die before they get them. Human pig chimeras could also be used for research into prenatal development and to test experimental drugs. A human lung in a pig might show more accurately the effect of a compound intended to treat, say, cystic fibrosis than today's lab animals. So they weren't allowed to grow past the fetal stage, but it is coming, guys. All of these human whatever hybrids have been happening in the last couple of years. They're very recent developments, and considering they've shown promise in the early stages, you can bet that this will just continue to keep going and going. I would not be surprised if within five or 10 years or so, there's some weird, disgusting looking pig human thing oinking itself around the human 
human hybrid barn. Number two on this list is the human monkey. I know that we technically descended from monkeys, but now it looks like we're taking that to a whole other level. Nature.com says scientists have successfully grown monkey embryos containing human cells for the first time, the latest milestone in a rapidly advancing field that has drawn ethical questions. In the work published on the 15th of April in Cell One, the team injected monkey embryos with human stem cells and watched them develop. They observed human and monkey cells divide and grow together in a dish with at least three embryos surviving to 19 days after fertilization. The overall message is that every embryo contains human cells that proliferate and differentiate to a different extent, says Juan Carlos, a developmental biologist at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies at La Jolla, California, and one of the researchers who led the work. Researchers hope that some human-animal hybrids known as chimeras could provide better models in which to test drugs and be used to grow human and organs for transplants. Members of this research team were the first to show in 2019 that they could grow monkey embryos in a dish for up to 20 days after fertilization. So they are literally making these human monkey things and gonna use them as a place to test drugs and other things. No wonder this is bringing up some ethical debates. A half human is going to be bred to get stuff tested on it and then have its organs harvested. Remind me to not get reincarnated as a human monkey please. Now I should note that this is a long way from being finalized and we are looking at many, many years until we have human monkeys walking around or being tested upon. But still, it is happening and they are already finding ways to make it work. Comment down below your feelings on this and whether you think that what they're planning to do is morally right or not. And finally, number one on this list is mouse human. So we had human mouse, and this is what I'm calling mouse human. Basically, it's the exact same idea as before, except this time, instead of nondescript human stem cells, they decided to go with human brain cells. Basically, what they've done here is take a mouse and inject some human brain cells into the mouse. This implant has actually shown to make the mice more intelligent than they were before. When referring to what it does to a mouse, Mouse's brain, one scientist said it's like ramping up the power of your computer. So there guys, it's just like adding a bit more juice to your laptop. Nothing wrong with this picture, nothing to see here. Yeah, alright Mr. Science Guy. Obviously, as you can all expect by this point, moral and ethical questions have come up about this practice and whether or not it should continue. I think what I want to know is, where are the human brain cells coming from? Are people like donating their brain cells or how does this work? All I know is that I need to hold on to the ones that I currently have and won't be donating any of my intelligence to a mouse anytime soon. 